like increasingly complex transactions and supply chains, massive data volumes, and tightening regulations. Learn from internationally recognized leaders in energy blockchain applications about the technology's ability to streamline operations, reduce operational expenses, and even create new financing and investment opportunities. So I'd like to welcome our moderator, Alexis Pappas. I'd also like to welcome our speakers, James Graham, Richard Stobie, and Stephen Enwhistle. Uh, give them a big round of applause. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us here for our panel on digital optimization and the future of the oil and gas industry. So we actually launched Alberta Blockchain Week, our province's first, with an incredible series of events that were hosted by Guild One at the Petroleum Club. How many people here uh, attended Energy Monday? Great, so there are a lot of people here who already know about some of the amazing work that our ecosystem is doing when it comes to world-leading oil and gas applications. And I think we're all very aware, of course, that you know, our energy industry is facing these massive challenges, uh, some of which are, have never been seen before um, in the industry. And a lot of these are very geopolitical in nature. They're these big, sweeping economic and political changes that are out of our control. There's not a lot that we can do about commodity prices or decisions made by OPEC or a lot of the other issues that are making our economy quite unstable in some ways with respect to our key industry. But there are things that we can control. There are business processes, there are different forms of optimization, and there are ways that our companies can help save money and cut costs using these emerging technologies that are being created right here in Alberta. So I would like to let my panelists introduce themselves. And we're gonna start with James Graham from Guild One. Hi, I'm James. I'm the president and CEO and one of the founding partners of Guild One. We've been working in the patch for about uh, 20 years. And we've been focused on asset intelligence for the last uh, 15. The, on, the advent of distributed ledgers and smart contracts offers us an opportunity to provide to the network services that are really about shared facts, shared processes, and shared ingest of data. And that's where the disputes live in oil and gas, so we're really happy to have been able to capture some of that onto ledgers that are operating, and I'm really happy to import that here today. Uh, my name's Richard Stoby. I'm a lawyer, but I'm one of the good guys. And uh, I, so I, I'm with the field law firm. I've been advising technology companies for about 20 years on software and, uh, and, and all kinds of interesting areas. So th this is just such a fascinating area. So, uh, so I've got uh, clients who are in AI and IoT and exploring blockchain opportunities. So uh, happy to be here. And my name is Stephen Entwistle. I'm currently the communications lead at Guild One. Uh, I have an extensive background in communicating in the communications in the technology sector. Uh, that also includes about eight years of working in the clean sec tech sector, so looking at climate change policy, renewable energy policy, and identifying and developing uh, greenhouse gas reduction and renewable energy opportunities. Um, for the last 16 months or so, I've been uh, working with Guild One, I've had the pleasure of working with James and um, working in the blockchain space. And in addition to doing the communications, I'm currently spearheading a couple of um, initiatives around environment and blockchain, which are really interesting and demonstrate a lot of potential. Excellent, well, thank you all so much for joining me on this panel today. And I'm really looking forward as, uh, as the audience to hearing what you have to say. So, the oil and gas industry is really dominated by partnerships, and this creates these incredibly complex transactions where you have so many different parties all trying to reconcile information. And this is where smart contracts really come into play, and this is one of Alberta's world-leading applications in blockchain technologies, which is really exciting. So I wanted to start off with Richard, and I know that you have some um, ideas about you know, whether or not smart contracts actually qualify as smart. And I was hoping you could give us a bit of a background on the technology itself and how you would describe it to a layperson. Sure, yeah, thank you. And, and, uh, and it's, it's interesting because this term smart contracts actually dates back to the mid-90s as a computer scientist who kind of 
uh, proposed this term to describe um, the implementation of a transaction that's that once it satisfies certain conditions, it, it automatically uh, you know settles or, or completes the transaction or, or the the steps that it's been told to complete. And so, so we're kind of stuck with this term smart contract, but you know, one of the famous definitions is it's neither smart nor a contract. And um, I was talking to a, a conference full of lawyers in Washington last week trying to explain to them that, that the, um, w the one way to think of it is to sort of throw away the term smart contract and, and replace it with implemented through software. Um, because the, um, the, the idea of a smart contract can be looked at on a spectrum. And par at one end of the spectrum, you may have fully automated uh, you know, agents that are divorced from, from human interaction that are going out and concluding transactions between themselves, uh, fully implemented through software. On the other end of the spectrum, you're gonna have uh, a, a more traditional contract of which a, uh, a so-called smart contract may be part of the impl implementation where, where the traditional transaction is set up through, uh, uh, th through what we think of as a contract, um, but part of that is delegated to software to, to finalize and to conclude. So, so that's kind of you know, one way to think of it. The, the other, in, in my thinking of smart contracts, um, you know, it's broader, it, it's, a, it's a term that also can be broader than just a, uh, something that's implemented, implemented through a blockchain platform. So it could be uh, non-DLT um, software that's implementing something automatically. Thank you, Richard. And where do you see the applications from your point of view in something like the energy industry? Well, I mean, there there are there are so many uh, possibilities. I mean, the um, any anywhere where there's a, you know, and, and it has to be sort of process first, technology second. So whenever there's a, a process that requires uh, multiple parties who who uh, are going to benefit from transparency uh, and and automation, you know, and, and the this, the um, the sort of the problems that play well to those skills that, that blockchain can solve. That's you know, the, and there and those are going to be. Uh, I wouldn't say they're narrow, but they're going to be a subset of the problems in the industry. And those are going to be great candidates for for this for for smart contract uh, related uh, tools. Thank you so much, Richard. And James, I know that you know you've become a world leader in actually applying this technology to the oil and gas industry. And uh, your focus has been on royalty contracts. Can you explain a little bit why that was such a good use case? Sure. I think what we need to reflect on is the cost of dispute. Um, and I, I, since middle 2000, I've had the privilege of leading a team that's been engaged with some industry sea changes. And I think we need to reflect that in the last 20 years, we've gotten a lot more digital. We've gotten a lot more granular in our in our data. The regulator has assisted us in Western Canada, in particular in giving us enough data points to actually pursue this concept of a shared truth. But the sad reality is that the disputes are born when we take those kind of truth metrics and apply them all independently in our own back offices and in our own processes. And in, in the case of royalties, what you have then is a case where the operator, so the person who's actually implementing the infrastructure and extracting the products, if you will, um, they are reporting their volumes to multiple places. They're reporting their volumes to their royalty partners. They're reporting their volumes internally into interdepartmental. They're reporting their volumes to the street for capital raise and for, for public company interests. They are reporting their volumes to the crown. They're reporting. So just in that auspice, you understand that the granularity of each of those reporting vehicles is different. And because we have different modalities or time boxes, different asset descriptions, and we're all maintaining our own databases in the back end, the disputes are born. And the disputes are very costly. And the industry is in a, in a situation right now where we need to completely rewrite our economics if we're to be the global powerhouse that we have been. And, and I think the, the interesting part of what distributed ledgers do then is that allows us to share the facts securely, privately, without having to trust the partner. The trust is in the validation and in the process. And those disputes are all born from not really trusting. And I've worked for some of the most progressive companies and uh, a lot of sea change happened in the middle 2000s with when the CN Pension Fund bought about, now it's about seven and a half million acres of fee title land. So 
land where somebody else is producing the reserve and we're on the, we're on the job to sort of make sure everybody's collecting what they're owed. And when you look at the royalties use case, that means we have different databases, different schemas, different processes, but related to the exact same production. The same well, the same data, the same product flowing from that well, the same set of entitlement subsurface, the same data ingest, the same contracts, but yet we encode them all in different systems. And because of that, we create a 95 day dispute cycle and we need the public data to come back in. But how about we get that previous to the transaction? And that's of course the promise of consensualizing contracts before you transact them. And that's of course what we do with DLT, you know, distributed ledgers, and when the counterparties all agree that the smart contract, the contract executed by software, is the source of truth, then as an industry we can actually move towards the concept of one single source of truth for all those data points. So last year, uh, your company did a world's first transaction involving a number of counterparties here in the oil and gas industry. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So we're still making hay from last year. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, what we did last year, and we needed the progressive leadership of Manulife, the CN Pension Fund, their oil operator is um, Freehold Royalty, Rife Resources manages that on behalf of CN Pension Fund, and NAL Resources. And at the onset you think, okay, it's a fairly simple transaction between NAL and, in, in that case it was Prairie Sky, I'm sorry, if there's Prairie Sky folks here, my number one client, so thank you, Mia Culpa. Um, the interesting thing about that transaction is on the surface it looks like a fairly simple gore, gross overriding royalty on an oil product being produced from a well. But the minute you start modeling in the smart contract terms and who might benefit from getting that data, you realize you're to six to eight nodes or presences on the network immediately. And that means you're getting pricing from somewhere. So you have an Oracle service injecting a price. And we had that, it was NYMEX for the first transaction. We have a bank that needs to settle it because we can't pay our bills or pay our people or keep our lights on with, with positions on a ledger. And ATB was at the table and did the world's first. And there's some ATB folks here, so thank you for your, for your progressive work. Um, and they were the first to actually settle what is now called a fiat stablecoin. At the time, we didn't really use that name because we didn't want to freak everybody out. Nobody wants to talk about crypto and oil and gas. It's only starting to emerge now. Then you also have the AER, who, although they're not privy to all the financial details, well, what about when the operator reports the volume, the AER knows? That means they're 35 days ahead of the current reporting system. So if the operator is reporting the volume and everybody knows. So what we proved with the first transaction last February was that you could do this all on ledger and keep everybody in the same game, same set of facts, same process, same automation around the calculations, the accrual of data and the execution. And then you could actually, and this is the linchpin, exchange value at the time. So we proved that last year. We got on the radar of the big companies like Amazon, R3 Corda, and we've become partners with them because it turns out that these Alberta companies that saw the light here were the first in the world to actually execute something like that, which we kind of thought we were, but then that was validated. And that has presented us with the opportunity to drive that into not only other counterparties, so we're now building nodes in Houston for Equinor, Shell, um, ExxonMobil, ConocoPhillips, Hess, Marathon, Noble, like about $1 trillion of market cap. And the, the one thing that I would say is our technology is being exported to Houston and we're getting value out of that and I'm very happy to do that. But we have an opportunity here to leverage the value of that technology here, create jobs here, be the world leaders that we are because of our regulator, because of our, our those, the interplay nature of the contracts as Stephen talked, or sorry, as Richard talked about, and now we want to drive that value that we proved into a broader base. So it's a really exciting time because adoption is now happening. It's, it's actually real and the big companies are now leaning in and building nodes on these networks. That is incredible that adoption's now moving forward and I think when you describe the whole transaction you see how complicated something that sounds relatively simple actually is and how many different counterparties are involved. And one of the most important counterparties in these types of you know, transactions are the regulators. Reporting to regulators is an incredibly onerous, bureaucratic process, and it's actually 
a barrier to entry for a lot of small oil and gas companies as well as you know a really large cost for most people operating in the industry so richard i wanted to ask you you know when we're looking at dealing with government you know compliance uh, is so critical when you look at a smart contract do you see anything in there that would prevent the government from accepting this? Do you see anything that stands out on compliance or do you think that this is something that we can move forward on with laws the way that we currently have them? Yeah, and, and the, um, so, so when it comes to enforceability of smart contracts, the, uh, the, my view, and, and, and this has been um, this supported by a white paper out of the Digital Chamber of Commerce that's reviewed you know, existing laws uh, that, that really came out of the kind of the dot com era. There's a there's a, a wave of electronic transactions uh, laws that came out um, around 2000, and the the um, there's there's good support for the idea that all those existing laws will are, are supportive of what's happening now in this in the smart contract space. So that new legislation really isn't required. Um, I mean, the great thing about the law, you know, one of the great things about litigation is that it creates new law as as courts, you know, confront new problems, they make decisions, and, and there's a bunch of flexibility there. So that's that's encouraging. Uh, and there's no cases in Canada, um, or as far as I know in the U.S., uh, out of you know a strict smart contract enforceability uh, dispute. But um, but the weight of evidence shows the the existing laws will you know will will apply, and, and, and we don't need new laws. There's actually a bunch of states in the U.S. that are that are passing smart contract specific uh, legislation in their states. And to me, it's a bit of a gimmicky kind of affair to say, hey, uh, you know, come to our state because we're friendly and look, we've just passed a smart contract law. Um, but, but it actually could have the, you know, the unintended consequence of, of confusing things because there's already a body of law around uh, electronic transactions that, that marries up quite well with, uh, with the smart contract uh, piece. And as far as you know, the government goes. The, the government has shown itself, you know, in the, in the Guild One example, and there's uh, there's other examples in at the federal level. NSERC has been using um, Ethereum to sort of track payments on NSERC grants, which you know, which is sort of a pilot. It's a it's a simple um, use case, but the government has shown itself willing to um, you, you know to adapt to that. And I think if their if their reporting requirements are satisfied that there's no reason it couldn't be implemented through a smart contract. And if they're getting paid in Canadian dollars, the government is not gonna turn that away because it's implemented you know, through, through a, uh, um, a software-driven transaction. Well, that's fantastic that it already fits within our existing regimes that always makes the process of integrating a new technology so much easier. So Stephen, in your a uh, really interesting career history as someone who's dealt with a lot of regulatory compliance when it comes to all kinds of environmental technologies. I was hoping that you could share some of your insights after you know all of your experience as well in the blockchain space as to how this kind of technology can help companies with compliance with regulators and how regulators could also use it to be able to facilitate less bureaucratic processes when it comes to data collection. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. I think the, the benefit really accrues to both the regulator and the regulated party. And it stems from the fundamental characteristics of blockchain. So starting with the, the transparency of data, so the data that's shared and open and most importantly immutable, uh, which creates a really strong audit trail so that companies have the opportunity to demonstrate compliance clearly and regulars, regulators have a streamlined way of establishing that the companies are compliant. Um, the second thing that really occurs to me in terms of the potential uh, for blockchain technologies is just they, uh, the smart contract creates the potential for automated submission, generation and submission of compliance reporting. So that alleviates a lot of uh, bureaucratic requirements on the terms of the regulated company, but also on the terms of the regulator. And I think this is particularly germane in the current discussion because um, this can support the current government's uh, push towards reducing red tape, the Act 4, uh, the bill to uh, the Red Tape Reduction Act. Um, and so I, the other, benefit which is um, 
a little bit understated in that is that these factors combine to make it easier for companies to comply with regulation. So from a, from a regulatory standpoint, what that means is you don't necessarily need to reduce the amount of regulation. What you need to do is make it easier for companies to comply and to demonstrate compliance with that regulation. So through the automation of processes, companies can take resources that are currently uh, devoted to uh, the type of make work uh, projects that requ require a lot of uh, administrative paperwork and you can free those resources up for creative, productive purposes. Um, from a regulator standpoint, if you're making a regulation easy to comply with, it has a lot better uh, opportunity for success. Um, you, you can have the best standard in the world, but if, uh, if there's political resistance to it, if you're unable to implement and enforce it, it, it has no effect. Um, Another aspect, uh, which doesn't necessarily tie strictly to blockchain, but to the integration of uh, a number of different technologies, is that it could create the opportunity for both the regulated company and the regulator to have access to real-time data at any point in time. Uh, and this is important in terms of compliance. It can ease, uh, it can shorten compliance uh, monitoring uh, processes. But from the standpoint of environmental enforcement, what it can do is if you combine uh, something along the lines of artificial intelligence and machine learning to understand the, uh, the data that is generated by normal compliant operations, uh, when it comes across uh, data that doesn't conform to that, so anomalous uh, data, uh, that can flag a, a drop in environmental performance that may be due to underperforming equipment, it might be due to meters that need recalibrating, or it could indicate um, a, an environmental incident such as a, a pipeline spill. And the benefit of that uh, opportunity to assess data on a real-time basis is that it alleviates or reduces uh, the chances of uh, an environmental incident becoming a major incident. You can identify when the incident is taking place, you can identify where it's taking place and you can address it immediately. Um, so, you know, again, the transparency of data uh, on the blockchain and the fact that the data is immutable um, allows the regulator and the regulated companies to demonstrate uh, that they're uh, meeting the highest uh, possible environmental performance standards. So I think this is a really interesting idea in the current concept because what this can do, the regulator can take um, the compliance data, and they can put it on a publicly available website, for instance, so that any party, um, critics of a project, advocates of a project, um, journalists, etc., can see that a project is compliant with high environmental performance standards. And I think this is really important in the current context because it actually gives uh, the regulator and the companies a much better opportunity to start controlling the narrative and to shifting the narrative towards um, one that is evidence-based and data-based, and one where that data is available to any qualified party to view. Um, so the, the, the final thing I would, I would just say uh, is that, to James's point, Alberta has the highest environmental standards in the world. Uh, we see other jurisdictions adopting D17, for instance. So if we're developing uh, technologies that are assisting in the mo measuring, monitoring, and reporting of compliance with systems that are based in Alberta, those technologies can be exported along with the regulations. And as James was saying, that creates opportunities in terms of growth and um, job creation. It also creates the opportunity to, again, strengthen and enforce the narrative around the environmental standards and performance in Alberta. Those are some absolutely fantastic points, Stephen, and I think it's really important to remember, you know, that Canada does have the world's leading regulatory regime in many cases for the energy industry. And at the same time, compliance with our regulations is a competitive disadvantage. We're dealing with a lot of these emerging lower cost economies that don't share the same high standards. But rather than rolling back our regulations, making compliance easier, um, I think, is uh, the best path, path forward. So, James, have you had any interaction with regulators in terms of having these uh, technologies kind of on the table for 
potential adoption um, by our government leadership or by any regulatory bodies? Yeah, absolutely. I was actually in Edmonton last week. I think we need to reflect also that the current price differential and the product stranding, um, you know, the pipeline issues. And I will address that there is one pipeline that's functioning very, very well, and that's the talent pipeline to the States, which is flowing as richly as it ever has. So I think we need to contemplate that there are systemic issues right now in the patch. And this is relevant to this question because the AER, uh, you look at some of the conditions that emerge from that. One condition is how do we deal with our license liabilities? We have assets being retired, forcefully retired in some cases. This week we saw an AltaCorp report and uh, some Globe and Mail and financial report narrative on six pillars of the uh, Alberta oil patch companies potentially being delisted and de-indexed. And why that's relevant to this question is we have dried up on our regulator. And that is we do not have in Saskatchewan and Alberta, we do not have anywhere near the budgets that we have had traditionally to maintain this level of regulation. Uh, Alberta is famous for a $70 million annual spend on regulations. How do you do that when the asset is drying up? Um, so the government is very motivated, the same way that the companies are motivated to re-vector the G&A cost, to re-vector the full cost of implementation and operation of these systems, and to truly share with their partners the database and then the processing and the onus then, the government is also looking to piggyback on that work. And this happens in two ways. One, the LLR, the License Liability Reporting. Uh, Orphan Wells, we all know, well, uh, Orphan Wells is an issue where the operator just dries up doesn't have the powder and leaves an asset in the field, that's very costly to the Alberta people. And the license liability report is how we actually understand the liabilities of the asset owners, holders, or anybody who had a stake in that asset. Currently, the AER will require 90 some days if a company throws their keys at the bank, and really the bank doesn't want it, they, they hit the floor, we, the Alberta people, and the government then are on the nut to actually retire that uh, or reclaim or whatever process is required to actually abandon that well in a safe and highly regulatory manner. So the AER is looking at, well, how can we piggyback on the industry's work as the industry looks to revector their finance? The interesting thing about a smart contract then is it knows inherently what everybody's piece is because it is the system of record for the transactional value of that asset, which means that the money is in the smart contract. It knows everyone's piece. So the compliance people at AER have had us in many times now on, okay, so if somebody retires an asset, we look into your smart contract and it knows who's actually there. And the answer is yes, that's instant. The smart contract knows everybody's piece because it's calculating the value exchange. So everybody's volunteering their information. And then the other side is the AER from reporting in unfortunately because we can't carry this burden of cost much more because our industry is in a beleaguered state they need to retire too massive or uh, retire is probably the pejorative they need to look at in the next three years how we're going to maintain the crown royalty system going forward and how we're going to maintain the petronix petronix which is the volume reporting system going forward so ledgers, smart contracts, and these true shared databases that we can use between the contracted counterparties work for the regulators, and the regulators have the most to gain then. They do not, the AER does not want to look into the financial transaction. That's not their mandate. They're busy doing what they do, but they do want to know about the volumes that they're reporting and who, know, who owns those volumes and who's on the nut for these liabilities. And we now have a mechanism that is truly shared where the regulator can play a piggybacking role on what the industry is doing and it, the compliance, as, as Stephen was talking about, and the reporting are inherent in the execution of the transaction. And that's how this all collapses down to one set of ledgers rather than everybody maintaining their own. We all maintain ledgers. All the oil companies have ledgers. They're just behind the scenes for their own purposes. This is the process of pulling those ledgers to the middle and sharing that data with, all, with everybody who's permission. And that is such a challenge. And that leads into our next question, which is, you know, the same incredible transaction complexity. All of these different counterparties with diverse interests and diverse needs and privacy requirements. In order for blockchain to be adopted, they all have to come to the same table and agree on some pretty fundamental terms in order to move forward. 
So Richard, I wanted to start with you on this one. Um, how do you make this collaboration happen? When you have these people with all these, you know, really divergent needs, how do you get them to agree on something really fundamental and start moving forward on this type of application? Well, I, th I mean, from a legal perspective, there's an apparatus you can put up, uh, put together for a consortium or an ecosystem of participants to agree on the ground rules for how the, the technology is going to be used, how the ledger will be accessed, which, uh, which elements of the transaction will be delegated to automation, um, where, the you know, where the data will be sourced, um, and, and the reliability of the source, and, and what's stored on ledger, what's stored off ledger. So all that can be, can be negotiated through uh, what we might think of as a more traditional contract, um, which, uh, you, you know, which lays the ground rules and the governance for participation in that kind of a, um, a collaborative system. So it really starts with governance and, and creating that framework. Um, there are actually some really interesting projects that uh, are coming out of Alberta for building these type of consortiums um, involving all kinds of different parties from you know, industry majors to government to uh, other you know, service providers. And I think Alberta is going to end up being a, a world leader in developing these organizations. Uh, is there anything that any of our other panelists would like to say on the consortium front? I, th I think it's important uh, to uh, not get too uh, hyped or too technologically de deterministic. So, you know, when I'm thinking about things, um, we are currently involved at Guild One with a project that will involve uh, a methane emission reduction technology and the quantification of the data and the collating of the data for automated submission for compliance reporting. We, we're hoping that at some point in time we can kind of push that down the line to convert to something along the lines of um, verifying and certifying an environmental attribute such as a greenhouse gas offset or a renewable energy credit that could be then sold into a market. Um, but in order for that environmental attri attribute to have real value or the compliance to have real value, there has to be an agreement amongst the, uh, the involved parties that the environmental value held in that, in, in that attribute is real and it, it meets the standards that are required for it to be an effective um, uh, at attribute. So as we're talking about it um, within Guild One and within our project group, one of the challenges that we have is that we need to have the regulator at the table. Uh, we need to look downstream to see what other parties may be involved, uh, such as parties who are certifying um, a greenhouse gas offset. Um, we need to keep in mind that there will still be, we don't want to become too deterministic with the, with the technology. So there still needs to be um, a role for oversight and audit. So we need to have the, uh, the auditing parties at the table as well. So I think we need to cast a broad net. I think we need to look uh, far down the line to see, you know, what, what will the project scope be, not just now, but, you know, let's say 18 months or 24 hours, 24 months from now and in bring to the table all the people who are going to be affected with that. But I think on the environmental side, as I think about it, you can't do anything without the regulator. The regulator has to buy in. And so for me, that starts with um, the requirement of an effective uh, proof of concept project um, that adheres to all the compliance um, requirements. Go ahead, James. Well, I was just going to reflect that we are working for a consortia in Houston called OOC, um, Onshore Operators Consortia, and, or Offshore Operators, sorry. And they are aggregates, four of the largest 10 companies in the world are in the consortia. And what they've done well, and I think this is an important lesson, what they've done well is vectored the value into the projects. Governance is key. Um, I think it's important, and, and it, I think it levers on both of these guys' comments big surprising three bespectacled guys agreeing. But I think the interesting thing is that they 
really put the use cases first and had the projects come around and the leadership from the companies that were interested in those projects come to those projects. And that's how we make hay here. That's how we can actually push these agendas down the road because there is a bit of paralysis that can happen. And although governance is required, that's not really the technology vector. That's not the technologist play. And that's not some of, you know, that's the, the domain of lawyers and the domain of consortia builders. And I think in Alberta, we're good consortia. In some ways, we need a consortia of consortia because this is an IoT problem. So there's the Alberta IoT nascent consortia. This is an ML AI problem, and there's a couple of people working on that. I think there's a couple of the big firms actually looking at consortia models. But what I think is really important, and we have CRIN, the Clean Resource Innovation Network, that's very important. We have, we have no shortage of kind of avenues of expression, but what we need to do is put cars on those roads. So to me, what OOC has done very well is pick some use cases, find some interested parties interested in those use cases, and then pick technologists who can execute those use cases with them. That's why I'm very, very cognizant that ESG and, and our, our good friend and, and industry stalwart Peter Terzaki you know, always says, we need to set the standards so that we can be at the table and off the menu. And I believe that. The clean tech investment, the reports that came out last year from multiple sources, or last month from multiple sources, the Canadian oil patch accounted for as much as 60% of the clean tech investment globally last year. We're not getting credit for that. We're not getting credit for the power of our regulator. So I think the important thing to do is to project and work on projects that we can push those agendas forward that have industry-wide appeal because we need to solve this problem. We need to lure capital here. We need to untap our reserves and our reservoirs and, and, the, and the power of our people and our regulations. And if we do this correctly, it's not, not just a consortia play, it's picking the right projects and getting those consortias to drive that governance into the projects so that they, we can execute models that will be world leading because of our backplane and what we've done as, as a citizenry. And that's just become such an important focus of the blockchain industry here in Alberta that it's time to move away from theoretical use cases and white papers and start actually building solutions and executing on them and showing the rest of the world you know, what we're capable of doing. Um, and one of the more interesting use cases for blockchain and oil and gas is in uh, measurement and instantaneous reporting. So in this incredibly data-driven economy, the faster you can access information, the faster you can use it, the faster you can begin to optimize systems, the faster you can begin to adjust to changing market conditions, it is just so critical. So Stephen, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about uh, measurement systems uh, using blockchain and how they can help companies access that data faster. Yeah, um, it's, it's not exactly my area of expertise except for kind of the conceptual way that you, we think about it in terms of um, the ability to, to track a product throughout the, uh, the value chain and the ability to upload um, data from Internet of Things connected sensors along, uh, along the value chain. Um, and at the same time, using smart contracts to automate transfer of payment at any custody transfer point. So as, as I think about this, um, I kind of revert to my background in renewable uh, energy and the concept of renewable energy credits. And the way I kind of look at it is, you know, uh, we, we have hydrocarbon resources that are coming, uh, being extracted and processed through a variety of sources, some of which have, a, a, you know, a larger um, environmental footprint, some of which have a significantly smaller footprint. So if at the beginning of that, uh, the value chain, you can create a, a certification of sorts that you can attach to a conceptual barrel of oil. Um, once that barrel of oil enters into uh, the value chain through uh, the process of, of the flow being tracked by uh, sensors along the value chain, um, those sensors then upload uh, the information uh, regarding the volume and value and constituency of the product onto a ledger so that you can, in effect, take those environmental attributes which are held in the certification and you can move those along the value chain along with that conceptual barrel of oil. 
So what that means is at the end of the uh, value chain, when the, when the hydrocarbon meets its final destination, if there's a compliance regulation around carbon standards, such as a low carbon fuel standard in California or in Europe, and that barrel of oil is going to one of those markets and requires that certification in order to qualify for that market, that, that certification can then be submitted in compliance with that requirement. If the barrel of oil isn't required to meet that any compliance at the end point, that environmental uh, benefit can be stripped away at any point in the value chain and peeled off for a company that may have um, greenhouse gas re reduction requirements and a compliance system like Alberta currently has. Um, it could be peeled off for a company uh, that is looking to generate and sell um, environmental attributes. Um, but essentially what you can do is that blockchain allows us to, to track that conceptual um, barrel of oil and to create a commodity out of the environmental benefits. Um, and and if, uh, just to, to kind of address something that James referred to earlier, what, one of the benefits that this could really create down the line uh, that, we, that we talk about quite a bit is the ability to tokenize uh, units of value, whatever that unit of value may be agreed upon by the market. And in, a, in, a, in an environment where there is, for instance, a greenhouse gas reduction requirement, you can create units of exchangeable value for reductions in greenhouse gases. We have that in Alberta right now with environmental performance credits for those who exceed their requirement, their compliance requirements. We have them for greenhouse gas offsets. And they're fairly common uh, in the uh, form of renewable energy credits. So really what this would allow us to do is create a token that would then be fungible for other tokens uh, of value, um, assuming that there can be agreement amongst the jurisdictions on the harmonization of standards and the exchangeability of value. That could create um, a, a large interjurisdictional um, exchange wherein people can take their environmental attributes and uh, exchange them. This could create new revenue streams, create new financial instruments. In a lot of cases, <clears throat> it could create new ways to, to raise capital, which right now in, in Alberta is a significant um, barrier, so. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, this idea that you can create these entirely new markets for products, whether they're environmental credits or in some cases, other more difficult to monetize uh, elements of these oil and gas industry companies. Um, so I wanted to ask James, is this something that you've ever looked at, this idea of helping companies commodify uh, assets within the companies, creating markets? Absolutely. I think the coolest project, I actually got a little shiver on that one, that was weird. Uh, the coolest project I'm on currently that we're on, in my esteem, there's a lot, if Stephen would argue that methane project is cooler, and it's cool. It's cool. I'm sure they're both cool. <laughs> um, one of, the, one of the issues with capital in Alberta right now, like, and, and let's put this in the lens of, of even measurement, there's 90 wells out by Tabor that are in a single well gas proration battery with one point of measurement. And why is that? Because there's not enough being produced out of those wells to qualify putting more hardware in. So the government just says, those 90 wells, one point of measure, you just let me know. Because there's not enough value in those wells. And this sort of isolates some of the capital issues that we have. We have a lot of legacy assets that are nearing the end of their life. And those are encumbering the companies that own them and in companies that own royalty interests in them. And it's encumbering uh, the crown. We talk about IoT and we talk about all these remote devices. That there's a lot of devices in the field and we can't afford to put a whole bunch more out there. So that there's this issue of legacy that is weighing heavy on us. And why that's relevant to this question is because one of the impediments to capital is this legacy. And, and one of the ways around that is to granularize, which is the function of a smart contract, to make the asset representation smaller, to make it more um, fractionalized, if you will, and, and okay, self-serving our patent on uh, uh, multi-state, multi-part blockchain transactions that fractionalize was just went pending in the states. So I just wanted to reflect on that. But fractionalization is the domain of the smart contract, which means instead of being impeded by all of this legacy work, so if you buy 
a share in an oil company, you might like a particular play. You might say, wow, that play out there is really cool. This company is going to do really cool things because they, the 2P reserve report is amazing. I want to invest in that company, but you can invest in that company without investing in their legacy stuff that's out there and pulling the market down. From a royalty perspective, you can't actually buy a, just a royalty on that product. So one of the projects that would be really interesting then is can you take a smart contract arbitrated asset, so pick a well or a field, and can you actually lend that directly to a fractionalization to sell units just in that entity, that asset? That, that way the high performing assets can become unencumbered by the low performing legacy and we can create a new capital uh, uh, lure which is look at this asset then, it is unencumbered by its past, it is unencumbered by the, by the other low performing assets and we can actually look at via smart contracts and ledgers how that asset operates, not how that company operates. And that I believe will lure capital into very particular plays that have good reserve reporting and have good outlook but are currently encumbered. So I'm really excited about those types of projects. So how far along is that project? Some of that's under NDA, but we're all friends here, I guess. Um, we're hoping to make some announcements in the next two months on some particular work there. I think the, the rubber will meet the road on that in the next 60 to 90 days. That's incredible, and that is just such a major issue for Alberta. When I moved here about two years ago, one of the first things that I did was attend an oil and gas industry conference held by one of the big banks. And as all of the producers got on stage, they all said the same thing. There's no money coming into Alberta from the US, from Toronto, or from big banks. It's all going to be internally generated financing. And creating these really innovative new ways to bring capital into these companies, to fund their growth, to fund their projects is so important. So that's a really, really exciting project. So we've looked at all kinds of different areas that blockchain can affect the oil and gas industry, whether it's environmental regulations, whether it's finance, whether it's navigating all these really complex operational and, and transaction issues that they run into. Um, when you put all of these pieces together, um, and I'd love to hear from you first, Richard, what do you see for the future of the industry? How do you see it evolving with all these digital technologies being integrated and streamlining all of these different components? Well, yeah, I mean, there's so many, uh, you could draw a Venn diagram of you know, overlapping um, technologies that with, with remote sensing and with you know, machine learning and with um, ledger, and automated uh, implementation. So I, I'm, um, I mean, if, if I could, if I could predict what was coming, I'd be in a different, you know, I'd, I'd have a different job. Just look in your but, crystal ball but, a little. That's all but, I ask. But but it, it is very, it, it's very cool. I mean, we've got a client who's who's got, um, who's sort of cr collecting data for remote sensor on integrity of assets, um, and. Essentially, not replacing an engineer, but augmenting an engineer's job in a way where it's, it's a lot of this stuff is as soon as you see it or hear about it, you're like, why are we doing it this way? Why aren't we doing? Why are we doing it the old way? Why are we doing it this new way? And, and how come it took us so long to get here? So that's that's just very. Um, it's an exciting time actually to be in this in this area. I think so too. I mean, there's so many changes going on and things are happening so quickly and often it is these really challenging environments that help provoke urgency in these big systemic changes. So Stephen, what do you see for the future of energy? Um, yeah, I agree. It is a, it's a really exciting time. I was, I was around in the late 90s working in technology and um, there was kind of the same buzz and excitement. Um, so it's, it's really cool, um, and I, 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 my hope is only that the, the, the potential, the vast potential that we're talking about today is actually realized. Um, I think in terms of, uh, of energy, just some of the things that we've alluded to earlier, you know, I kind of see the, the potential through the integration of technologies uh, to be able to, to track and monitor from kind of from wheel to well, which I think can have a lot of benefits. 
in terms of environmental performance, but mainly like the dem demonstration of environmental performance, which I think is an important uh, aspect. Um, I think the, the streamlining, um, so hopefully uh, removing some of the administrative uh, overburden, which is, in my mind, uh, an, un an unnecessary drag on productivity. Um, and then, again, as we talked about earlier, what I think is really exciting is the opportunity to start looking at you know, tokenizing some of these values um, and creating what I hope will be, you know, continental or global exchanges uh, for the value represented in those. Like, to me, that, that's really exciting and has the opportunity to open up some really interesting um, efficiencies and some really interesting business models and things like that. So, I mean, my hope is that the energy industry is going to be, you know, leaner, meaner, and greener. And uh, by greener, I mean both more uh, environmentally sustainable, but also um, more healthy from a prosperity and revenue generation standpoint. I like that. Leaner, meaner, and greener. And interestingly, one of the things that keeps coming up in my conversations as the ABC's Director of Energy with people in the industry is the idea that by being able to certify the environmental impact of a specific barrel of oil, we could actually help dispel a lot of the myths about how dirty Alberta's oil industry is by showing the world exactly what the impact was. And, you know, very speculatively, there could potentially be something like a market for low emissions verified oil. And Alberta could really be a pioneer in that with some of the great inventions that we have going on here. So James, when you're looking into your crystal ball, what are you seeing for the future of the energy industry here? I'm going to have to put hope in front of, of fear because my fears are profound in that we're weak at the wrong time and that we don't have as much capital to deploy as other regionalities. Every barrel of oil that's not produced in Alberta is not produced at the highest environmental standard and we need to think about that. We need to think about leveraging that benefit so I, I am in immediate alignment with every other context here. But I think what we also need to reflect on is the vast amount of G&A churn type administrative jobs that are going away. And I think we need to deal with that. When we say leaner, meaner, and greener, outside of thinking about the Rough Riders, which is just all wrong, um, that means we're actually working with a lot less staff. And I think this is critical to reflect on. It is important that we do this. But it is important then that we replace these jobs that we're losing to this automation with these higher ended jobs. And that is the opportunity that we have because of our higher environmental standard. These standards will not roll. If we want to talk about custodianship and a greener industry worldwide, Alberta standards should be more widely displayed. But what regimes would say that? Well, I'll tell you, 110 regimes came to the AER last year and said, we want part of Directive 17, which is measurement. We want to have that, that's the standard in the world. And I just need to reflect that, unfortunately, Ron Rose, one of the co-authors of Directive 17, has just passed away to cancer, and I'm sorry to bring that down, but I can't talk about Directive 17 without thinking about Ron. So rest in peace, Ron. Um, I think the important thing there is that we as a community have put these standards in place. They will not migrate as regulations. They will migrate as running efficient, lean, green systems. And if we can use our collective will and our collective uh, participation and our collaboration to build these systems, not only will the globe benefit from better standards being deployed, but this community will benefit as we lever into the digital future and create the future jobs in the sciences and the math that are required to drive this type of change. That is incredible. There is just so much potential for this technology to benefit not only our Alberta economy, but the entire nation as well. So I think it's at about time for audience questions. Are we done? Oh, okay, so we're just gonna have to wrap up now. I guess we ran a little bit over, but thank you so much for being here and we look forward to answering any of your questions individually out in the lobby. Absolutely. Thank you so come, much. Come talk to us. Thank you.